Okay, guys, um, addressing the problems with ionic cleanliness testing on modern circuits. Um, now, this is, of course, presented by me, um, Steve Statch, our head chemical engineer, uh, and myself actually got together on the research on this and wrote the white paper that corresponds. Um, but basically what we're looking at is um, uh, the cleaning cleanliness of today's uh, fluxes. So what is rose testing? Um, I think most everybody knows it is uh, resistivity of solvent extract. Um, basically what we're trying to do is remove any ionic contamination that would be on a board um, and then we're testing to find out how much of that ionic contamination is left on a circuit assembly. Uh, so how do we perform rose testing? Um, there's of course uh, the reason why we actually became, came about was there's a history of electrical failures um, directly linked to ionic contamination. So therefore, uh, the ROSE test was developed and it still remains the best process control for daily production reliability um, predictions. And this is, uh, there are some other methods of actually testing contamination. Um, the SEER methods, method steam extraction and ion chromatography are very popular. Problem is, is they're very destructive. Um, they have a high cost. Uh, and it's just not a great method to use on a daily um, for uh, daily control and qualification. Uh, this kind of gives you a little bit about the history of um, flux residues and rose testing. So in the 1960s was when they began to develop uh, or at least notice a lot of failures. So they began to look into it um, over the next few years trying to find out why these failures were happening. Um, that's when they discovered that, of course, there it was ionic contamination. So in 1971, the United States military um, developed the actual rose testing method, and that was uh, MIL-P spec 28809. Uh, so as the years came went on, um, they continued to do this testing. Um, and by the 1990s, we had the CFC crisis that came along, and basically what that was is we had to get rid of volatile chemicals to clean them, so we ended up getting, uh, you know, started to, to, to try to eliminate those CFCs. Um, in 1994, the IPC actually took over um, the ROSE documentation and began to um, oversee the actual ROSE test from the military. And in 2002 was the last time the IPC has done any revision to the ROSE test. So this is kind of a, the history of flux that goes along with the ROSE testing. So in the 1960s, they were using just rosin and water-soluble fluxes. Uh, by the 1980s, they had uh, the SMT uh, you know, technology came out, so they had to develop different fluxes to deal with SMT. Um, and that moved us on to the 1990s, of course, uh, with no clean fluxes was something that was new, um, and that was designed to, you know, directly correlate with the CFC crisis, um, and which is why they developed the lead-free solder. Um, and then by 2017, today, uh, we're actually using 10 different flux types and multi-solder alloys, um, much different than it was back in the 1990s or even in the 60s, um, or for that matter, even since 2002. Um, and one of the, you know, important to, to point out, lead-free fluxes are, in the 1990s when they developed, uh, they required much higher temperatures, making cleaning much more difficult. So, and of course today, um, with all the different uh, flux types, cleaning is much more complicated. And then basically what we're saying is that um, now that, you know, everything has kind of progressed, 2017 is here with different flux types, um, we need to improve our rose testing to actually address all the different flux types we're using today. Uh, now this kind of gets into the chemistry of it. Um, all ions, of course, are going to show a different response um, in different uh, solutions. So, and also, of course, by concentration. Now, what we concentrate on is we are looking for linear responses um, when we look for a solvent. So you can kind of see uh, some, some common ions that are on the boards, not all the ions, but common ions. And you can see that uh, we get a very linear response somewhere between 5 to 10 percent. Um, we don't, you know, as far as concentration of, of ionic contamination, we, we generally, in the SMT um, PCB world, we don't see anything anywhere near that high, but it's nice to know that we have a good linear response all the way up to 10%. So um, to simplify the math, we only use, um, in the 
the responses in lower concentrations because of that linearity. Now this slide here um, kind of gives you some the different uh, concentrations of IPA and water as well as 100% DI water and how it uh, results to your micrograms per square liter. Um, now we have our, our formula on here of how we figure out contamination. Um, and that is basically your total ionic contamination is equal to your test volume, which is the amount of fluid that you're testing in, times your delta of conductance, which is your change in conductance, um, uh, times your SSV, which is your solvent sensitivity value. Um, and that basically will give you a result of what ionic contamination you have left. So it's important to kind of point out we've got, you know, all the different, uh, you know, mixtures, acceptable mixtures of IPA for uh, IPA and DI water. Um, and you can see that there are, are pretty, you know, big differences in the reactions that you get with slight variations in the IPA. Um, so basically the question is, is that since we have this chart and, and we can see that, there's, that, that it's chartable and it's linear, why in the world are we restricted to just the solutions that are in that gold area? Um, as long as we can predict the reaction anywhere else, we should be able to use 100% IPA uh, for our testing, or for that matter, 100% DI water. So what we're looking at is to improve the ROSE test is to recognize that 75% IPA, 25% DI water does not dissolve all fluxes. Um, so we're looking for the IPC to recognize this and, of course, allow the use of, of different solvents that are designed designed to dissolve all free ionic residue. Um, free ionic residue, of course, is going to be anything that can be dissolved. In other words, it's not encapsulated. Um, so then we also, uh, of course, for, for our process, want to incorporate rose testing into the cleaning process 100% of the time. Um, and that's whether you're using a chemistry or whether you're using straight DI water um, or whether you're using a batch cleaner or an inline cleaner, anything like that, but basically assigning a rose value to every single board that goes through the process. So free ionic residue um, depends uh, on residue in your soldering profile, but basically free ionic means that it is soluble in water. Um, that is the definition of a free ionic residue. Um, finger soils rarely evaporate. Some flux uh, activators do. Uh, and also, you know, important to, to point out, encapsulated ionic residue that remains may not be free to react if the matrix is stable and hydrophobic. Um, now, basically what that means is that on a no-clean flux, a no-clean flux is, is, is designed to completely encapsulate an ion and be hydrophobic. So in other words, it repels water. Um, as long as a no-clean flux process is done correctly, um, there is no need to try to clean or absorb any ions because you don't want to um, break up that encapsulated ionic um, bond. So new rose extraction solvent, um, you know, we didn't look just at DI water. We wanted to look at everything, um, or at least as much as we could find um, when we did our testing. But basically the rose extraction solvent should dissolve free ions, um, and it should not mess with encapsulated ions. So this is just kind of a breakdown of the uh, 10 different flux types um, right now, and, uh, and then uh, some typical reactions that we see and, and through the testing that we've done. So if you're using a, a rosin, um, which you know would be a no clean, there's two different types basically, a non-activated and a um, low activity. Uh, what we've noticed is that 100% DI water does the best at dissolving any free ionic contamination. Um, IPA and water in any concentration can actually turn the residue white, anything that's left behind. I'm sure you've heard of customers that complain about that. Um, and it's, it's something that we've seen quite a bit as well, but in our testing we noticed that DI water actually removes the ions and does not leave any residue. Now, on rosins to be cleaned, um, you've got your three different uh, rosins there. We, we, through our testing, we've noticed 100% IPA does the best job. Um, when you introduce DI water to that, the DI water actually has the tendency to turn any, any residual residues white. Um, so therefore, we look at uh, 
for those particular fluxes, 100% IPA is the way to go. Uh, for no clean resins, um, DI water is once again, we saw 100% um, you know, reaction, in other words, we, we could dissolve 100% of the free ionic contamination with DI water, um, and we had the same reaction with our no clean rosin fluxes as above, is that the IPA and water can turn residues white. Now, resin to be cleaned is kind of a different animal all on its own. Um, your low activity and medium activity, we're recommending a 100% matched solvent. Now that uh, basically means that like dissolves like. So if you're dealing with an oily residue, you want some sort of an oily solvent. Um, basically kind of, you know, along those lines. Uh, through our testing, IPA and water um, does not dissolve, or may not, um, it, it can in some cases, but uh, may not dissolve all of the residue that's left on, uh, you know, a, a resin to be cleaned. And then of course your water solubles, DI water is your best, uh, um, your, your best solution, um, but important to note that through all of our testing with today's fluxes, that 7525 IPA is not recommended um, for any of the fluxes. So then we kind of get into some testing to kind of show this. So um, water-soluble fluxes, um, then this is water-soluble lead-free, uh, where we actually did some testing. The top line is we've got uh, IPA and DI water mixtures. We did this testing at different temperatures of that uh, and then took uh, pictures. And then of course our, our new reagent design down at the bottom is basically um, you know your DI water or a match solvent when we get to the match solvent stuff. Uh, once again heat it. So as you can see in the examples that on the first line the IPA and water did a pretty good job of actually cleaning the water soluble lead free flux um, as did the DI water on the bottom. Now the next one, this is where we kind of start to get into our um, our residues. So you can see the IPA and water um, as it went along, you know, may have have done some cleaning, but didn't clean them completely, and then left that white flaky residue. And then our DI water down at the bottom um, at 20C room temperature was not great, but as we heated it, we got excellent cleaning. Um, and then, of course, on our rosin, 10 lead, um, same type uh, reaction. You see IPA and water did not clean very well, left a bunch of residue, and our straight DI water at the bottom um, did 100% cleaning. Uh, rosin with 10 lead, uh, our third test, same thing. IPA didn't do so great. Um, our DI water at room temperature left a little residue, but uh, our... Um, uh, you know, as we heated it, we got we got great results. And then our no clean tin lead, uh, once again, same reaction. This is going to get a little monotonous, but uh, anyhow, the IPA and water did not do the the best job. And DI water, once again, uh, as we heated it, did a great job. Uh, no cleans, uh, same thing. You've got IPA and water that's leaving residue and not cleaning real well, um, so not dissolving all of those ions and DI water uh, across the board, cleaned it all, and uh, left no residue. Uh, no clean tin lead, once again, same thing. Um, IPA left some stuff. Now our DI water here did not quite do as good a job um, as it has before, so this would be an area that we would probably look at a different solvent for this particular flux. Uh, and then uh, your no clean lead free, uh, once again, IPA and water left white residue and straight DI water cleaned it up just fine. And no clean lead free too. Um, once again, you can see uh, residue from IPA and water. Um, a little bit of residue left at 40 C, um, but and a little bit at 20 C with DI water. But at 60 C, we cleaned it up perfect. Um, and kind of you once again, the, we we can go through these one by one. But uh, anyhow, you'll see that uh, IPA again is not cleaning really well. DI water does. So that was kind of our research. Um, that research was actually performed with uh, with Kaizen, um, so that we actually kind of worked together on that. Uh, uh, those those uh, at least that research. Now, 100% um, rose testing. Uh, this is what we're the second part of our argument is that it should be implemented into the cleaning process. And basically, all that means is no matter what you're using. Um, which type of machine, you have a wash, you rinse, you have a final rinse, and we're just saying that you should uh, insert your rose test after your final rinse before you're dry. 
100% uh, rows testing. Um, this is kind of how we um, how it works in a batch machine. Uh, you can basically see that uh, you know you you have your cleaning cycle um, and ba you know basically how it works. So you're going to load the machine, and the reason why we go through this is that loading is actually very important when it comes to uh, cleaning and rinsing resistivity. Uh, so you load. You can see we have a full chamber there. Um, then, of course, it goes into its wash section, um, so your chemistry is pumped in uh, and actually cleans. Your rinse to conductance is, uh, is the next step where you're putting in uh, fresh DI water, um, so it actually goes through a carbon, activated carbon first, mixed bed DI, and then goes back into the machine. Um, and we continue to perform those rinses until we reach a, uh, a set resistivity. Now, during your rose test, um, you're actually going to use the water that you have uh, already in there, and you have a starting point, um, which is your rinse to resistivity measure. So once you've reached that resistivity, that's your starting point. Then you do a timed rinse to find out um, what your change is over that time. So in other words, that, that's where you're getting your delta of conductance. And then, of course, you go into your dry cycle. So anyhow, so, so why rose testing? Um, now this is where board geometry and load actually makes a large difference. Um, so you can see here we've got on the left a, a, a batch machine that's fully loaded, and then on the right we have one that only has two boards in it. So now this is the data that we, that we gathered when we did this. Um, as you can see, the green area is the wash cycle. Um, the pink is your first rinse, and then conductance rinses, rose test, and dry. So as we did this research, you know, we wash for the same amount of time at same temperature. Um, we get into our first rinse, and you start to see a little bit of a difference. So you've got your um, your red line would be your uh, only two boards in the machine, and your black line is going to be a full, fully loaded machine. So what happens is, is you actually reach your rinse to resistivity with a, a you know, two boards in the chamber or a not loaded chamber, very empty chamber, um, much quicker than you can with a fully loaded uh, chamber. So therefore, what happens is, is you're you're not exposing the board to as many rinses. So yeah, you you may actually be able to hit that resistivity quick when you move on to your rose test. But it's not exactly what um, you know. It's not exposing the board to as much water, so therefore you're not actually rinsing it as cleanly. And we proved that once we hit our rose test, where we had a much higher contamination value on two boards in the chamber than we did on a multiple, um, you know, boards with multiple assemblies. So that's uh, that's how we do it in a batch cleaner, and then this is how we see it in a an inline cleaner. Um, basically, the board would be red at the beginning, whether it be an RFID or a barcode scan. Um, it would enter uh, an inline cleaner and basically be tracked as it travels through the inline cleaner. Once it gets to the rinse section, um, there would be a resistivity sensor um, down at the, the bottom of the rinse. So as the board entered, it would be able to measure the change from what it had before the board was in there, during while the board was in there, and then uh, you know once it left. Now, this is how it looks on a graph. Um, basically, those um, the humps there, anything underneath that curve is going to be your change in conductance, which is how we um, how we would do our calculation. And it's of course the amount of sodium chloride that's coming off of the board is proportional to the curve. Now, we do not have this developed um, as of yet. As far as we know, nobody has this developed, but it is something that. Uh, with some software uh, and board tracking as it goes through an inline, we believe it can be done. So once again, this is just kind of the different uh, the different looks at calibrating um, when it comes to an inline cleaner, or basically both cleaners. So your inline cleaner, as, as the board goes through, or, or you'll have a baseline when there's no boards in it. So in other words, you'll have a set resistivity that you'll be able to read. Um, as the board enters, you create that curve. Um, and, and that would be your change in conductance. So therefore, um, that's how you, you know, the machine really wouldn't need to be calibrated other than what um, the standard baseline, what, what your standard was as the board entered. 
Now, when you got to your batch cleaner, um, that's where it changes a little bit uh, because the batch cleaner, you've got stainless steel inside, you've got carbon dioxide um, that's basically going to leach into that reading, so you're actually going to be able to pull some of that out. So you have to have a background subtraction. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're running an empty chamber and finding out what our ionic contamination is in an empty chamber from that CO2 absorption and any leaching we're getting off the stainless steel. And then you subtract that um, from your final results, so therefore you know that uh, you're only measuring boards and not just, uh, you know, and, and none of that other absorption that's in there. So our proposed improvements to the ROSE testing um, is allow the selection of pure water and other DINI solvents to be used for ROSE testing. So in other words, what we want is just uh, solvents that can dissolve free ions and not mess with encapsulated ions. And we're looking for things that don't cause any other problems, any visual re uh, residues like white flaking or anything like that. Uh, and then we also want to incorporate ROSE testing 100% into the cleaning process. So we want to make sure that we test all the boards, not just the typical sampling that's, uh, that's scheduled or that, that is approved right now by IPC. So benefits of ROSE testing, um, or at least 100% ROSE testing, you're going to save time by eliminating the need to pull a sample and perform separate testing. Uh, increase production because you don't have to stop production to actually pull a board, um, go over, do a ROSE test, wait for the results, and see, uh, you know, see how your process is going for the day. Um, electrical test yields are improved because you're getting a, a, a reading on every board rather than just one at a time um, or one from each shift once per day. Um, and then product quality and reliability, of course, are improved because you, you know that you're actually putting out clean product. Um, that, of course, results in a cost savings. Um, so our conclusion is it's time to improve the ROSE test. Uh, solvent restrictions need to be expanded to allow choice of the best extraction solvent. And the ROSE test should be incorporated into 100% of all manufactured boards.